In the 12th century BC, Ramses II was building up a powerful fighting force to protect Egypt and conquer new lands. To achieve this, he needed the most advanced weaponry available. One of the most highly developed weapons was the composite bow. Stored away in the Cairo Museum is a unique set. These amazing weapons are 3,000 years old and have been magnificently engineered. Bows and arrows had been used for centuries by the Egyptians, but invading enemies like the Hyksos brought new technology. You have the Hyksos coming in with their compound bows, confronting the Egyptians. They can stand off out of range of the Egyptians and shoot them to pieces with compound bows. And the only solution the Egyptians have to that is to get the compound bow themselves. The Egyptians first used simple bows between three and six feet in length. These were later surpassed by the more powerful composite bow, constructed to achieve the greatest possible range while retaining a manageable size and weight. Inside here is an extremely sophisticated piece of engineering. The body of the bow is created using thin strips of buffalo horn, which keep their shape and act as a powerful spring during firing. The horn was then attached to a preformed piece of wood with resin and left to set for a month. Once that's set, then the string comes off and that's, that's a bonded unit. Your horn's there. You've got a powerful spring, but there's so much energy locked up in there that it will explode on release and could break. Animal sinew was used to bind the bow together. Beaten until fibrous, it was bound around the main body for greater penetration. These are incredibly strong fibres that resist tension. And eventually, it's going to look something like this. And this is then layered on the composite of wood and horn, and it gives strength and protection to the whole structure. All the elements of the bow were held together using a resin glue derived from fish, but this took a very long time to set. This is going to take something like 18 months to two years before it sets to the right and stable consistency. So making a composite bow was a very highly developed technology, but it was an incredibly expensive technology. Today's equivalent composite materials are fiberglass and carbon fiber. It's the same thing. Horn is essentially carbon. So when that's laminated with fiberglass, these are the materials that we go to space in and the other gizmos of our modern day society. But the concept of composite structure giving extreme strength is as old as the Egyptians. With a composite bow, you don't need to restring it just before the battle. You can actually carry the bow around ready strung for quite long periods. So the composite bow was a big leap ahead from that point of view and was absolutely essential to the, uh, the new Egyptian armies of the New Kingdom. This was a really ingenious piece of technology. If you look at it in its unstrung shape, you will see how the composite materials, the horn, the sinew and the wood, have been set for a preformed shape. So you can see these limbs are already set as a spring, so that when I string it, you've already loaded the spring in its state of rest. These limbs are already straining forward, and you get this wonderful shape that we see on all the wall carvings. And then when I pull it, it changes shape yet again and metamorphosizes into this wonderful crescent arc full of power. Taking 18 months to complete, the composite bow was considered a precious and revered weapon. These extremely ornate bows were found in the tomb of Tutankhamun and are some of the finest examples ever discovered. The composite bow was the most powerful ancient bow to exist. Its design was developed over thousands of years until it was perfect. But just how powerful was it? This is a bow of the Mongolian type. It's a horse archer's bow, designed to be used from horseback. These that you see here are seers, and they're held to the bow by the knee, 
and they extend extra energy to the bow once it's drawn back. They give you a virtually unlimited draw right back across the chest and that's when the bow really starts working. That's when the sears impart the energy to the bow. This is a, a modern composite, it's a copy and it's made with modern materials which are which are quite good, but not as good as the original materials. They were made by craftsmen. They were very, very, very potent. I would say you're probably looking at something twice as powerful as, as what we use now. The speed of the arrow leaving the bow is incredibly fast. Only when we film at high speed and slow down the image can we see how effective and highly engineered this weapon really is. Action! Yep, you can already see the sears there, the slight sears starting to come in. Once the arrow is released, it actually bends around the bow to allow it to carry on straight. And then what it does is what we call fishtail from side to side until it straightens up. And you'd probably be looking at probably close to 300 feet per second for an arrow. 300 feet per second, that's over 200 miles per hour. The impact from such a weapon would be fatal. Ramses II had amassed a powerful arsenal of weaponry to challenge the Hittites at the Battle of Kadesh. There was one more weapon which would be crucial in the outcome, the lightning-fast Super Chariot. Chariots became the most important piece of military equipment that a superpower could possess. Chariots evolved over time from what was initially quite a clumsy um, cart with, with solid wheels and so on into eventually the ultimate war machine, very lightly built, very efficient. It was probably the most complex object that anybody in the ancient world ever attempted to construct. The warrior pharaohs of Egypt came into conflict with enemies who used fleets of chariots in battle, but only built up their own chariot corps through trade and seizure. Once they'd mastered the art of chariot building, the Egyptians developed their own vast fleets. Images on tombs show mass production of chariots being manufactured for battle. This was clearly a unique moment in, in history when, for the first time, the entire resources of a state were deployed to producing um, a chariot on what was essentially the, the first production line in history. Recent uh, discoveries that were made at the site of Ramses' capital at Paramesis in the Delta have actually revealed a military industrial complex complete with workshops for manufacturing various types of weaponry and even essentially a store uh, house for chariots and parts of chariots. By the time of Ramses II, the Egyptians had not only adopted the chariot, they'd almost perfected it fine-tuning it into the most superb machine of the ancient world. The Egyptian craftsmen took the chariots and they're technically incredibly difficult things to make. The wheels, masterpieces of construction, but they made a light, fast chariot which was better than the enemy's chariots. Chariot expert Robert Herford has built replicas of both Egyptian and Hittite chariots. It's a light, maneuverable, nippy little job. You can imagine it being uh, very manoeuvrable in tight corners uh, and a uh, useful thing around a crowded battle scene. Egyptian chariots consisted of a lightweight wooden circular cab with an open back, on top of an axle with two wheels of either four or six spokes. The wheels were meticulously assembled. This is the sort of thing that uh, the ancient Egyptians were using. It's a bent wood rim. Um, outside that is a rawhide tyre. The spokes are actually braced by tyings of animal fibres round their roots here. And so that was the way it was done in the Bronze Age. The beauty of the Egyptian chariots was that they were strong but extremely lightweight and manoeuvrable. In contrast, the Hittite chariots were much heavier and more solid, good for charging through ranks, but much slower. Each had its merits. By positioning the axle further back, the Egyptians created a chariot which had a much sharper turning circle, allowing them to move quickly. Yet the Hittite chariot's heavy axle enabled them to carry a third man into battle. 
Here we have a detail of the Battle of Kadesh, and you have a typical Hittite chariot. It's a larger, heavier chariot than the Egyptians have, holding a three-man crew. Also typical of the Hittites is this distinctive hourglass-shaped shield. You would have had a, a driver, a shield-bearer, and an archer. The third man's role was to shield his fellow charioteers from enemy weapons. He was aboard to give protection to the archer, because when they were being attacked by other chariots, then it was a question of maneuvering, and the Egyptians would try and get alongside, usually along the right-hand side, where it's difficult for the archer to shoot across the driver. And they would come alongside and shoot at the chariots. 